policy level um, inspection on all the climate issues. And we have three expert speakers here with us today. Uh, I will introduce them all to you and read their, their bio. So, and then basically this to say is a very much a discussion section. So we will um, we will have a few questions that we've already prepared for, for our panelists. And then very much leave it up to you guys to ask them questions too. So uh, our first speaker today is Mr. Nick Nami. Executive of E3G, which stands for Third Generation Environmentalism. Uh, it's a non profit European organization dedicated to accelerating the transition to sustainable development. And in addition to his management role, Nick is leading E3G's work on European climate policy, climate diplomacy, and foreign policy, all very relevant to this session, and to the security implications of climate change and resource scarcity. Nick was previously a senior advisor in the UK Prime Minister Strategy Unit, leading work on national and international policy arenas, including energy, climate change, countries at risk, instability, organized crime, and fisheries. Our next panelist is Professor Anna Davies. She's a professor of geography here at Trinity, and she also directs the Environmental Governance Research Group and is on the steering committee for Trinity Center for Future Cities. She chairs the Royal Irish Academy's Future Earth Ireland Expert Group and is a member of the Royal Irish Academy's Geographical and Geosciences Committee and the Planning and Environment Research Group of the Royal Geographical Society. She's also Secretary of the European Roundtable on Sustainable Consumption and Production and advises the Irish Government as a member of the National Climate Change Council and she's a member of the Expert Group on the Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change. And just to say that Anna is speaking in her own personal capacity as an expert uh, academic here. And our final speaker, all the way from Poland, is Mr. Gregor 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 Gregorski. Head of the Climate Policy Unit and the Department of Climate and Air Protection of the Polish Ministry of Environment. Uh, as you know, Poland will be hosting the next COP, so so his contribution is very relevant to that. And he's been working on the UNFCCC negotiations since COP19 in Warsaw and is currently part of the Polish COP24 presidency, heading the Polish climate change delegation to the EU and serves as national focal point. Uh, among other appointments, he's an alternate member of the Kyoto Protocol Compliance Committee and advisor to the GCF board member and previously worked on international law and EU international relations in the College of Europe. So we have incredible speakers here today, uh, here to offer all their expert advice. And as I said before, this is very much climate, past, present, and future. So I want to kick it off with Nick and just ask you, what has happened since the climate Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak. It's such an amazing event. Um, first of all, I'd like to remind us how massive an achievement Paris was. Um, when you follow environmental the ones you know seeing that we will fail to agree to the Marine Reserve in Antarctica <coughs> last week. Um, I think it's all been quite simple given the importance of ocean. So, so you see, we can't even do that, but we managed to get all the nations in the world to agree to a binding framework on climate change. It's an amazing achievement, but, but again, Paris made us safer. We didn't make us safe, but billions of people made uh, Paris on the planet. Mitigation still leave us in the danger zone of climate tipping points for all runaway climate change. And unfortunately, again, if you follow climate science, you realize that all of those danger points seem to be closer than we thought they were, even when we negotiated Paris. So we need to do more using Paris as a platform to make this happen. So that's really the, where we are. We need to use the Paris platform but to make it more solid, which is what we're going to do this year in Poland, but really going on increasing ambition using the Paris moments every five years to raise ambition. And where are we, are we on that? Well, Firstly, I suppose we're getting a bit real. Um, there's some good things that happen in the real economy. Everything we thought we needed to do, all the energy is cheaper than we thought it was. 30 years cheaper than we thought it was going to be running into Paris. That's good. Electric vehicles have come up to real alternative. That wasn't even on the table before Paris. So everything we need to do has got cheaper and seems to be easier to do from a technical point of view. Um, but it's also got more real. We realise that we actually have to do harder things like agriculture. Like looking at people's consumer behavior, like actually untangling the networks of fossil industries. That if you again follow US politics, you'll see Exxon has come out in Washington for a carbon tax, 31 million, but actually in Washington state, is fighting with other oil companies to stop any carbon tax we put on at all. So there's lots of hard politics which are now real too. So we've got real, and 
we need to work at how to make those changes the pace we need to do. Um, the second thing that's happened since <coughs> is um, we've lost the leadership. Um, and one country that's getting off this is France, with President Macron, who has shown some real leadership, even if domestically France still needs to step up a bit more. But um, particularly with Angela Merkel, um, the UK being in Brexit, la la la, not really at the table, we've lost a real progressive core of country. And at the same time, of course, we have Trump and now Bolsonaro pushing back on climate action. So um, the bottom up is doing well, and we're seeing leadership from cities and businesses and investors really moving, moving things forward. But the political leadership we have running into Paris has faltered, and it's not really there to drive ambition forward. Um, and that's really both a consequence and a, a cause of this broader environment. Actually, the whole, not so much climate change cooperation, but all international cooperation is under threat. This is one of the reasons why leadership is so lacking. With the rise of trade tensions, with great power politics, with the idea that we don't need rules to live on the same planet, we can all just, um, as Trump said at the UN General Assembly, you're all lovely nations and you're all going to work to do the best for your own nation. And the subtext was, we're the biggest nation and what we want matters most. You can't run a world of 8, 10 billion people with a fragile ecosystem with that approach to working together, or not working together, where might is right. And actually, the whole issues around the trade war with China, with the tensions we're seeing all around the world geopolitically, are the biggest threat to the climate process in Paris. And you know, the midterms in the US tomorrow are really going to be a bellwether for whether we're going to see Trump as a four-year phenomenon or as an eight-year phenomenon. And if countries see Trump lasting beyond this term, they will change their views on a lot of issues and a lot of ways they work together. And perhaps we will see a rise of the rogue fossil fuel producers like Saudi and Russia, who have been hedging their bets to be honest, for the last two years, um, really coming together to push back against the Paris Agreement. So that's why we need to push our leaders to be so strong, because the geopolitical environment is much more turbulent than we ever expected coming out of Paris. So good thing is bad thing, but we need to prepare to really push on delivery the next two years, or we won't get nowhere near what the IPCC is saying is offered by the I'm sure you'll get some questions about the, the Trump effect because, of course, when Paris happened, we, we didn't really see that coming. And if we could follow up from the first comment there, we know that the countries, their nationally determined contributions uh, pre Paris, were not in line with staying under 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. And maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what Ireland has done since 2015 and, and where we're at with things like the Citizens Assembly and the national level. Sure, thank you. Yes, I think. We have to be very careful to talk about the different spheres and tiers of actors, and I think today has been really, really useful in highlighting just some of the great innovators and creativity that's out there in terms of actors who can contribute to making us a more sustainable planet moving forward, including climate action. And I think what was clear from previous speakers was that how these things all intersect, it's not just about climate science, but it's also about how we live and how we wish to live in the future. So very inspiring um, ideas in, in the creative marketplace, and I think that there is a lot at the grassroots. I think what is difficult is to identify and have an overview of that kind of thing. Um, certainly some work that we've been trying to do, and I know other research projects are trying to do, is map the landscape of innovations. And I think having to our hands a real overview of the kinds of activities that are going on would allow better coordination. Because a lot of the activities which are going on may seem in isolation to be small interventions, but collectively and replicated appropriately according to context could really contribute significantly to our collective actors, a collective effort. So I think. One thing is there's a lot of grassroots stuff, and we know that because of people who are here, the activities that have already been uh, presented to you today. Uh, we also have action, obviously, amongst the policy sector, and you know, the, the Citizens' Assembly on uh, Climate Action was, was very inspiring to be part of because of the support that came through the members of that Climate Assembly. And I think for a long time it had been a kind of default position can't talk about climate change because people will just switch off. They're not interested or they become so um, despairing that they don't take any action. And I think the results of the Climate uh, Citizens Assembly showed that there was actually uh, an appetite amongst everyday folk, not just those people who are particularly interested or specialised in a particular area, to support action. 
So I think that's been a really positive uh, development, which has to now be seen rolled out through the national dialogue. And Carl, you know much more about that than, than me, but that's happening now. We've already had one of the regional dialogues. Another one's happening in November, soon, soonish, in Chile. Um, and so these are about creating a conversation about climate action. But what concerns me and what I don't have clarity on around the national dialogue is exactly where those conversations go. I would like to see a greater pathway being developed where those conversations can bear fruit, that we see a clear line of action from <coughs> conversation to implementation. So while that's positive in terms of public action, I would like to see perhaps a little bit more. And certainly in terms of policy action, obviously personally disappointed um, with the budget recently around action on, on the climate. And we have a lot of finance pro promised, but there's not a clear line to implementation of that finance or what will emerge through that. So greater clarity around that, I think, is desperately needed in order to not lose this grassroots swell of public interest and commitment to taking climate action. Because I think we're at a moment where I can really be a leader in citizen <laughs> engagement on climate action, but it's an opportunity that must not be wasted. Because if we collectively do not take that opportunity, and particularly uh, political policy officers take that seriously, it will be lost and it will be very difficult to, to regain that sense of momentum. So we are at a cusp, I think, in Ireland around how we move forward in that regards. So we have climate ambassadors, I saw that uh, outside in the creative marketplace, fantastic initiative, again building with the, the enthusiasm uh, and the commitment of, of people to take the message out further. The grassroots actions, and not only those which are branded as climate actions, something like the Rediscovery Centre, for example, in Ballymun, which it reminded me when we talked about the, the, the cup earlier in the creative marketplace, these kinds of actions about reuse, recycling, are all part of the climate equation, uh, and we must not lose sight of those other actions. The climate kick, also I noticed one of the presenters mentioned the climate kick. Ireland is a member of, of the climate kick. Sustainable Nation provides uh, input into this. Trinity hosts the, the journey, which is a summer school where um, participants get to travel around Europe for lots of different actions. These are all really positive things. The EPA is funding research on climate action. We have researchers here in the room who have research projects examining both the uh, climate change policy and its evolution and where it should go. We have European funded projects which are looking at these sort of innovative ideas. Energize, for example, which is run out of the National University of Ireland in Galway, uh, looking at community energy initiatives. So it's a huge amount of activity, but I want to be able to see the whole landscape a bit clearer and to establish the impacts of all these actions. I think that's really important, because despite these actions, we know that emissions are going up in Ireland, and we're moving away from our targets. So finance is guaranteed through the key measures in the National Development Plan, but implementation and timelines are still unclear. I think that's where we need to take most action. Okay, thanks, Anna. Yeah, I wouldn't say, it's funny how you picked up the National Dialogue, but I'm involved, but I'm very interested in the Citizens' Assembly. Because I think if that showed anything, it's that when you bring 100 people into a room and you let them consider climate action over two weeks, which is unprecedented, that they come up with really strong measures, and they did come up with 13 very strong recommendations that the government is correctly obliged to respond to, right? Well, it's being discussed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I mean, it is the cusp of, of that moment there. Gregor, if you can follow on, I mean, we have Paris, and we have our own kind of domestic situation here. Um, now we have Poland coming up, COP24. Um, very interested to hear where you see the negotiations going and you can give us a little insight to that process before it kicks off in a second. Sure. Um, I think when, when we're talking about COP24 and uh, possible outcome, uh, hopefully a success in Katowice, there are two dimensions that are nece not necessarily the same thing. One is what the negotiators are uh, wanting to achieve in Katowice, and the other is what the world is expecting from the process. Um, you know, working as a negotiator, I, I know the intricacies of, of the process, um, the timelines and uh, the deliverables. And for that, the absolute must for, uh, for COP24 is to finalize the Paris Agreement Work Program. Um, which means getting the implementing rules for the Paris Agreement 
um, for every party to know how to um, implement its provisions. And the deadline is this year, and uh, we absolutely must uh, observe this deadline. Uh, not only for the credibility of the process, but also because of the change in the international environment that we mentioned already. Um, you know, probably that's the last moment where we can uh, do it very uh, easy. And there is willingness from the parties as far as uh, I can see so far. The main challenge is uh, um, it is it's just a lot of work, it's uh, hundreds of pages of text. Um, the other thing that the negotiators are looking forward uh, in COP24 is the Talama dialogue, um, the successful uh, conclusion of the dialogue that could um, prove that parties are serious about uh, considering uh, global efforts to tackle climate change. And there are plenty of other agenda items that uh, will need to be finalized. Uh, one of them is uh, operationalization of the uh, local communities and indigenous people's platform. So that's inside the process. But the outside world uh, is a of action. And that's what you know, matters in the end. That's what the negotiators are working on to facilitate that action. Um, but on this front, there are limited, um, there is limited capacity and process to deliver. And that's something that we're trying to, um, to set into the general public um, to do a bit of uh, expectation management. Because um, Paris, we decided to we decided to uh, go on with the national training approach, which means that um, ambition is in the part of the
It emphasized urgency. And it puts it up to us to respond in practical ways in our, in our individual lives. Because we saw from our distinguished guest from Chad, we're literally burning indigenous people to death by our life choices at the moment. So I just want to point to you, surely the best thing each of us can do as individuals is to switch to a plant-based diet. And when you look at the statistics, when you look at the analysis, it's terrifying how compelling that statement really amounts to. And I really don't think in Ireland we can evade that question because not alone can we not be climate leaders because of the responsible way. Can you ask a question so we can get more questions? Oh yeah, sorry, I apologize, Madam Chairman. Sure. It's just asking that we have to put this front and center. We have to confront this choice. We, even if we can't do it, we have to admit okay. that the switch to a climate based diet okay. is essential. And we're really getting our own responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Lewis's uh, proposal there, that's the kind of things we need to push for. Massive change in carbon taxes, BRT, uh, deep, um, oh, sorry, I apologies. You get the point, yes. You get the point. Collective, collective action. Would you just pass the, the mic down here for me? Thank you, and thanks to the panel for fantastic inputs. My question is in relation to um, the upcoming COP. So I've heard the expectation around um, finalising the rulebook, etc., for the Paris Agreement. But I also understand that there's a really urgent need for pre-2020 action. And I wonder if anyone on the panel could reflect on what of anything we might be able to hope for from the upcoming COP to push that urgent action um, pre-2020. Thanks. Great, thank you. So if I get the panels to answer those questions, I think. Mind that there's a lady and a gentleman there in the middle of the room that those three hands there, and they can, they can ask the next two questions. So, if any of you want to take any three of those questions, I think you're on. Well, that's all I'll say. I agree with that. I agree with the sentiment. It's a very huge issue that we're starting to get into. But um, I'm reminded of the last couple of change. This is what we're seeing everywhere. Why? Because politics is entangled with fossil fuel interests and people don't feel the pressure from the other side. So I was talking to DG Klima in Brussels recently. He said to me that he sees heavy industry and, and gas industry all the time. There's not a single industry that's impacted by climate change has come to see him. So firstly, let's mobilize some political constituencies. Those people impacted by climate change, which in Ireland is the same as the biggest and it's agriculture. Why aren't they there? The people paying the bills for the flooding, the people paying the bills for the flood effects, the industries that are going to be hit by this. If they're not in the politics, and we know they aren't, they're not paying money to lobby, they won't show up. At the same time, citizens have to really get on the beach and say, why are you building the wrong island? Why are you building the wrong buildings, the wrong transport system, the wrong power system? It's your money, either as a consumer or as a taxpayer. We've got to get to the nitty gritty of why is the money going to one place and the other. And let's be clear about this. It's politics, but it's also corruption everywhere, in every country, soft and hard corruption. And it's poor systems of governance. And you solve that by holding your representatives to account. There's no other simple way. But focus on the money. Why are they spending money in one way, not another? And that's where there's a real agenda about making sure your taxpayers' money is not being squandered on the infrastructure that will be the wrong infrastructure. You have to replace it in 10 years. Make it that issue as opposed to a long-term plan. <coughs> on COP24, I think this comes down to, I don't think there's going to be a huge amount on, on the pre-2020 agenda that's being kind of politically massaged away. 
Actually, most people in most, so Europe's doing quite well pre-2020. Emissions have gone up a bit this year, but we're over-abating in Europe. Beyond 2020, it looks really bad because people aren't putting the policies in like heating area, housing, and transport. Um, it's quite easy to turn off coal power stations and build windmills. You kind of know how to do that. The next stage is much harder for the politicians and practically. And my big fear is not actually that it won't look okay in 2020, but that will be a false sense of optimism. It won't have laid the foundations for the real deep change beyond that. So that's why the next two years you really have to put pressure on governments to make new commitments beyond 2020 and back them with cash. Because otherwise we'll all hit a wall and then the whole idea of this deliverable will unravel quite quickly, to be honest, if we don't, if we don't make the positive think more long term. And not in long term 20, we're talking about five to ten years long term. Um, and make sure we can get somewhere near the Paris goal. Yeah, I think I would agree with, with a lot of that. And I certainly think the problem is climate change is that it's a systematic issue, it's a systems issue. If we focus on what we can do as individuals, we won't be grappling with those systematic infrastructures that we need to put in place. So absolutely collective action is clear. Now, the politicians do worry about what the, the, the voters uh, vote and they will pay attention if there is significant collective action and groundswell from support. As you, as you rightly say, though, that there are other actors that are very influential in that system and it's not always visible for us as citizens to, to see how they have influence and to see what decisions and who's in those conversations. So some transparency around decision making would be really, really important there as well as collective action from my perspective. Um, with regards to a plant-based diet, I mean, it, it, again, it's a very complex issue because it depends where you are and who you are, what kind of plants you're eating and where you're eating them. I mean, we all know, but it's very easy to dismiss a complete argument on the basis of a single issue, and avocados were something that was really, really important brought to break because they were perceived to be a very trendy um, plant-based consumption, but actually, you know, are hugely consumptive in, in other ways of resources. So you need to be really, really careful about, about making blanket statements. Um, but we need to consider just transitions in an Irish context for rural communities to ensure that simply by suggesting that we move to a <coughs> form of production, food production, that we pay attention to those people whose lives are very much reliant on the current system. And this works not just for farmers, but also those who work in current heavy industries, also fuel industries, and what are these people going to do? We need to ensure that there are alternative pathways, alternative income streams to provide for these these individuals and these communities, and I think that that's really, really important. So we need something that's a win-win-win for society, economy, and the environment, uh, and, and there are no regrets solutions out there that we need to consider, but it may require shifts in cultural and social norms which have taken place in the past. This is nothing new. <coughs> to do that, as you rightly say, with a long-term horizon, with the good of Ireland and the planet within that decision-making uh, process. Actually, what we have our problem with is key, but of course the whole you very much have similar issues around coal and, and jobs, and so perhaps you can speak from, from your perspective on some of those issues. Sure. Um, I wanted to first address the pre-2020 issue. Um, so on um, Katowice, um, there is a Ministry of Pre-2020 Stop Taking uh, event, um, which is an event from, from the previous COP uh, in Rome. And um, it's going to be a, a high level discussion uh, focused on both mitigation and finance in the pre 2020 perspective. Um, but if you look uh, into that topic and what it actually can achieve, you, uh, you might say that, um, well, how much we can achieve pre 2020 if it's end of 2018 and uh, decision making at national level takes. Uh, a lot of time, in the EU takes more time, I mean, what can we still do pre-2020, two years to deliver? Um, but on the other hand, um, as we heard, I agree that there is actually a lot going on uh, in the pre-2020 already. Um, in mitigation, uh, Doha amendments, uh, because the protocol did not enter into force yet, but it's implemented by the European Union, so um, its targets will be achieved nevertheless. Um, and finally, the <coughs> uh, commitment to deliver $100 million per year um, is also underway. Um, this 
besides the uh, US engagement. Uh, plus, um, I think that there is a very positive uh, effect of uh, the Paris Agreement and the NPC process. In theory, they apply post-2020, but we can already see that they do have a positive impact already now because countries did uh, engage in uh, national planning and policy making for uh, post-2020, but some of that legislation is already in force, so um, countries are in fact, not only in Europe, but you know, across the world. So I, I wouldn't be that desperate about the pre-2020 situation. So there's a little thing that you have to do. I just have a question that's been asked to Germany. Just in terms of policy implication from its DC countries working with geoengineering companies, having tactics concerns for sustainable companies and working with more fossil fuel companies to have a more sustainable approach in business. terms of policy implementation of governments, do you see countries working with geoengineering geo companies having tax incentives for sustainable companies and working with more fossil fuel companies to have a more sustainable approach in business? So um, I think that nature is our first, uh, first um, 
answer to that, and so hopefully we will need to get together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, we're not a lawyer or a geoengineer, so um, th those questions are a little outside my comfort zone, but in terms of geoengineering, it, um, it covers a whole range of technologies and interventions. So um, I think that the, a one-size-fits-all response is probably not appropriate there, and I know some of the arguments which are kind of alluded to in, in the previous response around the moral hazard of investing significant amounts, particularly in research and development, around some of the technologies around geoengineering. Um, but at the same, same time, researchers are uh, always like to explore the possible. So experimental research of carb capture storage, for example, is something that is ongoing and, and may well be extended. Um, but to be cognizant of the first preference being working within our natural systems uh, and not allowing uh, these situations become sort of trickling into being essentially a moral hazard of uh, having to invest in these responses, which in some way allow people to perpetuate unsustainable consumption practices. Um, again, the, the legal challenges, I think it's important um, that all routes of conversation and dialogue are explored, and I think it, it does again show a critical mass of people coming together to push for change. And so it's an incredibly important it's a symbolic action. I wouldn't know whether it will have legal um, implications. I don't know, I'm sure we have some uh, lawyers in the house that may be able to help more in terms of identifying how that process might take place. Uh, the dashboard in Ireland, I wasn't sure of that question. I don't know if it was what the question was precisely, but uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Um, yeah, I just we were referring, we didn't know about the Green Island, the Ireland, and the War of the Green Island, but, but I think you could, but the dashboard, um, and you mentioned you can place that with the Climate Council, but that's not something that, that you do. Uh, Ireland's been a more than an hour, which means that you can be in the Climate Council. Is this at the UN level, or is this? This is at the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. Okay. But I think, I think you just can find an advisory council point of view. Jail that they 
knowingly have not done the best job for their shareholders or their um, pensioners. Um, that's going to make a real difference. And I can tell you, talking to big mainstream law firms in the UK, which is where most of them live, this is a big topic because they're defending a lot of these cases against small litigants. So um, I think that might well be one of the, uh, the, the dark horses that moves the dial a bit faster than people think it's going to be moved. So we know what to do with your shareholders. <laughs> uh, so I'm very sorry that I have to wrap up this discussion because it could go on for a long time, I'm sure. And uh, I just want to thank all of my expert panelists here.